Hi everyone, so my name is Una, I am a second year University of Nottingham engineering student and I will be hosting with Stephen Powley a couple of robot day talks. So the first one is done by our lovely speaker David Evans and we will be talking about end-to-end -end attack detection for the connected vehicle. So just to give you a brief idea, Robot Day is held every year. You've got a mixture of online, unfortunately only online this year, but also in-person activities. And um, they're essentially going through STEAM. So it's your conventional STEM, but it's also going through arts. So there'll be talks, talks every Monday in October done by us. If you want to find out more, you can go onto the website, which brings you to the East Midlands event. You've also got Robot Day Derby, which is another event on the 6th of November. There's also some Roblox game making competition, which you can find on that website, as well as Systems of Robot World, where you can submit robot art to that website, but the closing date is fast approaching. So we are asking as the IT to seek to better understand the characteristics of IET community audiences, so yourself, and how well they are being represented. So we really appreciate it if you could help us understand where we need to improve by completing this survey, which will be open throughout the whole of 2021. The link is there and also we can put it in the chat later on after this chat for you to access. So while interacting with this webinar, the Q&A function will be open. So if you have any questions, please put them in there. And at the end of the talk, we will select a couple which our lovely speaker David will be able to go through and answer. Please do make sure you are muted and please also remember that this is recorded through Zoom so if you want to go through it again later you're more than welcome to do so once this has been published. So to go on to our speaker, so David has been working in the automotive technology industry for nearly 10 years. He's been supporting the development of vehicles in several connected and automotive vehicle research projects. He graduated from Waterford Institute of Technology in Ireland and is now leading connected vehicle and cybersecurity activities for his company, IDI ADA UK, and leads the Automotive Security Research Group chapters for Cambridge and Oxford. He also enjoys low level open source tools such as Arduino and Raspberry Pi to reverse engineer vehicle networks. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you over to David and he'll be able to talk to you about his lovely topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Una. Um, hopefully I can just share the screen now and hopefully that is being shared right now <clears throat> okay so hi everyone i just wanted to say thank you very much for taking the time to join this presentation today thanks a lot for the iet for having me and also a big thank you to una stephen and sandra also for arranging this talk today so the best thing to do is to start off with who I am. So my name is David Evans. I studied in Waterford Institute of Technology in Ireland. I moved over here uh, to Cambridge nearly 10 years ago, uh, where I work for Aplos Idiata. So here I lead the Connect Vehicle and Automotive Cybersecurity R&D activities. This involves supporting a number of R&D projects, both locally in the UK, and sometimes I get involved in a number of European funded projects. 
So more recently, I've been supporting several functional safety and automotive cybersecurity development activities. So these are the kind of projects where you are working on systems which go out onto the road today. It's quite a nice feeling when you see vehicles driving along that you've kind of done some work on and you, know, you can point to that and say, yeah, that's quite nice uh, to see. In my spare time, I also lead the Cambridge and Oxford chapter of ASRG. This is the Automotive Security Research Group. Uh, which I encourage you to look into, particularly if you're interested in automotive security topics. There's a lot of great um, presentations on the YouTube channel uh, from people working in industry. I'm also involved in a number of industry groups. They, <laughs> they might not mean anything to you unless you're working in industry. And the reason I'm here today is to talk to you about the Horizon 2020 security automotive use case. Um, what I want to try to do as well here is to not just focus exclusively on that, but hopefully give you a bit more um, kind of background, let's say, or uh, interesting tidbits into this kind of area and how you can, let's say, not need a vehicle or hardware or software, uh, well, you probably need software, to do some things yourself, learn some interesting things, and hopefully carry them forward to, um, you know, potential job interviews or things to kind of help progress uh, your career if automotive security is an interest of yours. Um, so what well, I just kind of comment a bit about the company I work for because I'm obliged to. Um, so Apple City Ada is a key partner to the automotive industry. Uh, there's, key, there's three key areas of development, testing and certification. On the testing, you'll see in the bottom right-hand image is an aerial view of the test site. We have the largest independent testing facilities in Europe where you'll see any vehicle brand. You can imagine testing their vehicles 365 days a year. In the UK, um, so I work in the Cambridge office, uh, we have two other offices, both in Nuneaton and in Warwick, and we're currently building our own test track in Oxford. Um, so I work in the electronics department of the organisation, so my involvement is limited to the kind of computer systems effectively. What you see here is a number of different domains that, let's say, electronics fall into. So you have ADAS and automated vehicles, or AV, as well as vehicle connectivity, um, all the way through to human machine face, human factors, it's quite a big topic at the moment, um, infotainment systems. And then underneath, you have the kind of varied um, levels of support. So the kind of high level electronic architecture, how all the different systems to communicate with each other, things like functional safety, social and cybersecurity, which I'll touch on a little later, as well as software development, EMC testing, uh, and how that affects vehicles. <clears throat> so jumping kind of to the presentation itself. So kind of where to begin, essentially. Uh, I like putting this picture up because here we have a very, very cyber secure vehicle. Um, okay, I, I wouldn't expect it takes a lot of effort to break into this vehicle, but let's put that aside. Uh, why is it cyber secure? There is zero connectivity here, and there's also no sophisticated systems that could be manipulated by the unsuspecting driver. Um, I'd also like to point out a very interesting video. Uh, I just find this quite interesting. Uh, it's like a very early form of intelligent navigation in the 1970s. Essentially, you would buy these cassette tapes of directions to popular destinations. You would um, put the cassette in to the, into your tape deck, what have you, and you'd start off at some sort of fixed point, like a local point of interest. And the tape would then give you directions. So the system knew how far you traveled because of the vehicle speed and that would line up the next queue. So if you drive two miles down the road, it knows there's a junction you have to turn left at. The vehicle or the cassette would know that you've traveled two miles based on the vehicle speed and then line up the next, maybe think of it like a track on a, on a CD um, and then kind of give you the next navigation, which would be to turn left. Um, very clever for the time, but it kind of falls through with, uh, you know, it all takes a wrong turn. Anyway, in summary, if you can, can't attack the system, it's no fun. <clears throat> so where are we kind of going today? Well, I guess both figuratively and literally. Uh, what we're all aiming for 
is that point where a car is capable of driving from point A to point B without any human intervention or any, let's say, human taking over under any circumstance. Uh, a goal here is to, let's say, remove the human error. So everyone makes mistakes. I've learned to drive when I was about 26 and I think I'm quite a nervous driver anyway. Um, we all get tired for several hours, whereas a computer won't. Uh, a computer won't panic. Humans will almost certainly panic in, in some situations. Uh, you know, if a car cuts across them and they feel they may have to brake or swerve away. Um, and this may just result in perhaps a human making some maneuver that ultimately causes a, a crash or maybe just makes the kind of situation worse. Um, but maybe a computer will make a decision to break maybe a fraction of a second quicker than a human will. And in these kind of situations, that fraction of a second could be the difference between a fatal in, uh, injury or a minor injury. But while these complex computer systems are great at addressing most problems, they might not be capable of doing so safely. And I would just say the key word here is safely. <clears throat> so where are we today? We have somewhat self-driving vehicles. I put self-driving in quotes there. It depends who you ask about what the definition of self-driving is. We have vehicles on the road with sophisticated systems, uh, ADAS systems or advanced driver assistance systems for emergency braking and lane keep assistance systems. These systems are mostly safe when used correctly. I like this picture. Um, there's a requirement that a user must keep their hands on the wheel when using some ADAS features, whereas sticking an orange in between uh, fools the sensors into thinking there's hands on the wheel. In vehicle development today, there's a big focus on the development of exceptionally safe systems. To give a generic, uh, to give a generic example, in all vehicles, there's a combination of hardware and software which determines whether the airbag in a car should be deployed. The expectation is that when the airbag needs to be deployed, it does so, it does so very quickly. But when you think about it, there's something constantly checking. Do I need to deploy the airbag? Do I need to deploy the airbag? These systems are rigorously developed, tried and tested throughout the years. But more recently, we're introducing connectivity and forms of external influence into the vehicle remotely. I'm not saying that someone could hack your car to deploy airbags while you're driving on the motorway. But the design of modern vehicles are now, to a certain extent, asking those types of questions. Could this happen? And what are you doing as a vehicle manufacturer to ensure this doesn't happen. But how does a vehicle manufacturer ensure this doesn't happen? They go through a lengthy development process to demonstrate they have done all they can to prevent such things from happening. An analogy I like to use is, what if the self-driving car hits a bus full of lawyers' children? I appreciate this isn't directly related to a talk today, but I guarantee that if you have an appreciation for these topics going into an interview, there are, to a certain extent, brownie points to be had. The first pillar of this is functional safety. The definition is the absence of unreasonable risk due to hazards caused by the malfunctioning behavior of electrical systems. It's about making sure that there, if there's an electronic failure, it doesn't cause the vehicle to do something it probably shouldn't do. The second is safety of the intended function. The definition here is absence of unreasonable risk due to hazards called by functional insufficiencies or misuse. I gave the example earlier about the orange. When they developed the vehicle, they never thought that someone would stick an orange in the steering wheel. It's this kind of general idea where a system should only work in, in specific domains or specific restrictions. And finally, we have cybersecurity. In a way, it's quite similar to functional safety, where the focus is on security and the security of systems within the vehicle. It is used to ensure there is a minimum level of cybersecurity considerations during the vehicle's development. These three go quite uh, well together because I guess to a certain extent, can you really claim your vehicle is safe if it's not secure and also vice versa? Again, I would encourage, uh, let's say, an appreciation of these three topics, especially if you're considering um, an auto, uh, a career in uh, automotive systems development or just, just that general um, area. So 
what I'd just like to do is just comment a little on the architecture going into the following section. So this is a very generic architecture of a vehicle. What I want to get across here is that we have several computers or what we call ECUs or electronic control units communicating with each other over a network to achieve some sort of functionality. So just to give an example, if you are in the rear seat of a car while it's moving and you unbuckle your seatbelt, a sound might start pinging to alert the driver. There's one ECU monitoring whether your seatbelt is connected, another determining how fast you are traveling, so the vehicle is moving, and another ECU which maybe chimes some sort of noise to alert the driver. This is a potentially an unsafe situation. So, you know, if you had to swerve or there was a collision, for example, um, obviously you would be in a better place having your seatbelt attached. So there's the kind of responsibility to alert the driver something is is unsafe. Um, so these ECUs share a kind of inter, uh, interface um, with each other, something ultimately that's kind of connecting them all together. Some piece of wire that is passing signals to and from within the network. But I guess the kind of question is, what happens when someone needs to connect to this network who may or may not be, let's say, an active participant on this network? Sorry. Um, so here we have the OBD port, uh, onboard diagnostics, pretty much all cars have them. Um, we have kind of two flavors of OBD. Uh, OBD1 is probably long past gone now, and OBD2 is kind of here. Um, essentially used for vehicle servicing and checking faults. Uh, if we go back to maybe 10, 20 years ago, uh, these tools were quite difficult to get for, I guess, Joe and Jane public, whereas it's um, not too difficult to actually make these yourself or to kind of acquire, let's say, tools you could use to make your own, let's call it an interface into this. Um, I think it's worth noting as well that to a certain extent, most vehicles have have this interface. I, I say most, I think um, the Tesla Model 3 and Model Y have started to phase out this, um, this interface onto a vehicle, but I think it's safe to say if you have any sort of petrol or diesel or even hybrid car, it's quite likely you have this interface anyway. And it's 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 just convention for, for servicing and, and getting access to the vehicle. But what I'd like to kind of highlight is we have these two particular wires that are of, of interest. So again, these are standardized interfaces. Um, to a certain extent, they have to be there on the vehicle and they have to be accessible to what I refer to as the outside world, but really it's just this port that's um, on the vehicle. Um, so I mentioned low cost tools. And I think you can, you can certainly do a lot with Raspberry Pi these days. There's a lot of great hats and shields you can buy for specific applications. Um, in the image uh, here, I'm using a can shield. So this allows me to develop some software on the Raspberry Pi, which will communicate with the vehicle. So using the interface I mentioned earlier. Um, if you are really pushed, you could do it cheaper. Um, you know, using something like an Arduino, but in the end, all you need something uh, is kind of capable of listening and speaking can. And if you can wrap some sort of logic around that, you can do some interesting stuff, which, you know, could, um, uh, let's say, upset the vehicle network or do something that the manufacturer never intended uh, for people to do. So I think it's just worth highlighting kind of what can is just for those who may be unfamiliar. So we have CAN, it uh, stands for Control Area Network, which was developed by Bosch in 1986 and is very commonly used in automotive industry. So why is that? Because it's tried and tested for several years, it's robust, reliable, and it's very low cost to implement. And it's used for sending and receiving messages over CAN. So this is a horribly complicated um, diagram, but um, it's, it's, it's essentially a standard uh, for, for how a CAN message is um, assembled and how the um, signals act. So if you hooked up a, a oscilloscope to the CAN uh, network, 
and you were tapping into the two wires I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, th these are the types of um, uh, signals that you would see. Um, but essentially, we have kind of three components that I'd just like to focus on from this diagram. And I've just made a nicer diagram here, um, which is essentially just the ID itself, so the message ID, the DLC, which is the data length, uh, and also the kind of payload here. So we have byte zero all the way through to byte seven. And what I've kind of mentioned here is that we have some signals here that we want to uh, populate into this payload. And there's kind of general ways of kind of assembling um, that data here. But, you know, how, how, how could I kind of show like a practical example of this? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I'm going to show here is kind of a, an example of how a signal could be placed into a CAN message uh, using something like the Raspberry Pi. So this is a small example. Um, using just the C, C++ implementation. So we want to take something common like uh, vehicle speed um, and then take the value, so 18.5 meters per second, just, just for argument's sake. Um, what we want to use here is, you know, we're going to assume a minimum value of 0 0.00 meters per second, which makes sense. But we also need to kind of represent this into a 16-bit um, value, so two bytes effectively, which will go nicely into our eight, uh, eight byte payload. So kind of a good way of kind of calculating this is work out what your minimum is, work out what your maximum should be. So here I'm just going to assume like a ridiculous maximum value of uh, 122.87 meters per second which as you can see there is a kind of nearly a crazy value, but it fits nicely into two bytes for this particular uh, um, demonstration. So here's some code, and we are effectively going to be converting the 18.5 meters per second value into two bytes. Earlier I mentioned that one bit represents 0 0.01 meters per second, and we will use the 16 bits representing 18. Point, uh, five meters per second to populate in the CAN message. So here's the kind of CAN frame or the CAN message that I mentioned earlier. And I'm just going to populate the message ID. So uh, hex 100 goes nicely into our ID. It's just an arbitrary number here. Just a, so it's a way of identifying what message contains what values. Um, and then here we're just assigned the DLC. So payload eight, just for argument's sake. Uh, and then we just want to kind of assign some data. So kind of a general good practice is, you know, we have a payload of uh, eight bytes and we don't want kind of um, non-initialized data going in to here. So we're just going to set all the values to zero, zero, because that's just a value that when we developed the vehicle, it, it was a conventional way of initial, initializing data. Um, and then what I'm going to do is, we're going to take the first byte of our um, meters per second, our uh, vehicle speed signal, and put it into the first byte, uh, which here is byte one, um, for representing our vehicle speed. So you see in the blue text the value hex 073A. Uh, and what we've done there is put the first byte um, into byte one. And we're just going to more or less do the exact same thing for putting 3A. And this is probably just a very basic way of encoding vehicle speed and will be kind of obvious if you're looking for values that gradually went up and down in terms of vehicle moving. So being able to kind of analyze these values or having an appreciation of, oh, there's a value going higher as I'm um, going faster, for example. There's kind of ways of, oh, well, maybe if I apply some factors to this, you could potentially work this out. Um, but I just like this as kind of a general example, just to show that it doesn't take a lot to take something like a Raspberry Pi, take something like, like a can shield, and just, let's say, listen to data, try work something out. And it's just quite um, an interesting topic if you're into things like reverse engineering. But, you know, you want to try to do some stuff, uh, you want to code, so it's very easy to get started. You don't even need a car or hardware to do things yourself. 
there's excellent support with Linux CAM and support in a number of different languages. Um, I've actually prepared some introductory examples to kind of get up and running with Linux CAM. Uh, you see um, a little link at the bottom there, but you know, if, if you want to try play with CAM for yourself, um, kind of virtually so if you have a linux laptop or a virtual machine with linux something like that it's very easy to get up and running and doing something useful again you know can is going nowhere in industry uh it might get phased out but it'll almost certainly remain um in in the automotive industry because it's just a bit too much a bit too difficult to kind of get rid of it let's say uh but kind of how's this all related to automotive security? So we have a network of computers talking to each other. They're passing messages to and from each other to do stuff. Um, in most vehicles, there's a port that you can tap into with low cost hardware and open source software available. So is there something that you know you can do here? And that's that's kind of exactly what I did. So um, some time ago. Uh, not long after we went into lockdown, I did exactly that. I took a Raspberry Pi, I took my cable, plugged it into my car and tried to work something out. So I had an LCD screen in the vehicle um, and I reverse engineered the messages to you know what was populating that uh, signal. Wrote some software around it to you know emulate, to do something with the data. So I wanted to put my own text on the screen uh, using something like, um, you know, passing a passing a string or some text over uh, over a you know from my phone, for example, over Wi-Fi into my, into the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi would take that and then um, populate the LCD screen. Um, but you also had to kind of listen as well to what the LCD was saying because it wasn't a, a case of just passing three or four CAN messages to the LCD screen to populate. Uh, you had to kind of manage a, an exchange between the Raspberry Pi and also the LCD uh, screen. So normally the LCD screen communicates with the radio and CD player. So, for example, if you tune into Radio 1 and whatever FM frequency Radio 1 is, uh, there's kind of a protocol for passing that data uh, to say, you know, you are currently tuned into Radio 1 and it populates that on the screen. So this is just kind of a very small example of what I've done. Um, so just scrolling some text, uh, populating text effectively on the LCD screen. And that was all done with, Ras with a, just, just a Raspberry Pi and a little bit of hardware. Um, and I won't go too much further into it, but I've done a presentation just covering that in much more detail. If you're interested in checking that out, there's a link there. And I'll put the link into the chat um, once I've stopped presenting. Um, so now I've I I just wanted to kind of introduce that because it was um, kind of an interesting thing. Uh, at least I thought it was interesting for uh, you know trying to take a system that you kind of that you had access to and try do something you shouldn't do and kind of what I'm just going to quickly divert back onto the kind of core topic now, um, which is exactly the work done under the Secure IT project. So it, it was all related to uh, the kind of previous 10 minutes, trust me. Um, so this project aims to address kind of cross-industry security issues with embedded internet-enabled devices communication with a remote cloud service. So not too dissimilar to your traditional connected car applications. So we were interest, <clears throat> we were interested in the kind of embedded device at the vehicle, but also where the data was going and whether or not it was being attacked, tampered, or manipulated between the vehicle and the cloud service. But the kind of interesting bit was, you know, were we capable of um, predicting uh, an attack was going to happen? Um, so effectively, why an automotive use case? So you know, for a lot of the reasons we talked about earlier. Uh, I like this phrase, the modern vehicle is a two-tone IoT device on wheels. Um, it more or less is. It's a massive um, ecosystem of data, uh, just, just generating data. And it's not just that. You have infotainment systems with smart navigation, Google Maps, Waze, what have you. Um, 
effectively at your head unit, uh, you know, it, it is most likely linked to your phone somehow. Your contacts probably sync to the head unit to, you know, so you can call someone from your head unit, uh, which is why, you know, if you're ever renting a car, for example, probably not a smart idea to sync your phone or, or at the very least when you're done with the rental car to try remove um, all your personal data from that. But effectively, the kind of vehicles now, they just have an extraordinary amount of external interfaces. Um, so 3G, 4G, soon to be 5G, uh, vehicle to X communications, which is like um, kind of ad hoc communications from vehicle to vehicle, uh, just for passing data. Uh, but I mean, it's controlled mostly by software now. A lot of vehicles are very software driven. Um, you know, it, it's it's not like the kind of very old car we've seen earlier where, you know, you are turning the steering wheel and you are, let's say, mechanically turning something, um, which is, is still relatively, I guess, somewhat the case nowadays. But, you know, uh, there's there's a lot of software in between, uh, between you turning the steering wheel and actually turning the wheels. Um, but it's also connected to a complex electronic architecture, which we've touched on a little bit earlier. Um, but I, I would say the kind of automotive industry is a kind of, let's say, a convoluted supply chain. So while you are buying a vehicle from vehicle manufacturer A, chances are everything inside that vehicle was not developed exclusively by um, manufacturer A. So it's you know quite outsourced. It's uh, quite a let's say a complex supply chain i would um i would argue but okay vax uh access to a significant amount of data and makes the kind of ideal um attack service and subsequently the use case so you know what's the architecture the use case no surprises here but you know we have the vehicle and we then need the vehicle capable of something communicating uh, with both the external cloud service and the internal vehicle network. So the kind of CAN networks I talked about earlier, uh, whatever system is inside the vehicle. Um, I'm just kind of referring to this as an onboard unit. This is a tool that we've developed in-house for kind of connected vehicle R&D projects. Um, and finally, the kind of cloud service where the OBU or the onboard unit can upload data to or download data from. Um, and what kind of introduced here is the secure IoT service um, in this project, which is kind of, a, I would say, an independent system capturing metrics from both sources, monitoring the integrity of the data or activity between the two, the two systems. And we've kind of wrapped this up into two different um, scenarios. Um, so just comment a little bit about the vehicle architecture. So the OBU was running a Linux-based operating system, so something similar to the Raspberry Pi we mentioned earlier, but a bit more uh, beefier, let's say. Um, and we have several kind of vehicle interfaces uh, brought in. So we mentioned the, the CAN bus um, earlier. So the kind of OBU was kind of ideal for this project because we wanted something a bit agnostic to the kind of production vehicles. So, you know, no uh, big vehicle system, um, you know, because we, we wanted to do kind of complex things here with, and we didn't want to, I guess, quote unquote, upset the actual vehicle um, we were working with. So for example, we had a kind of cellular modem built into this um, device here so we could get internet access rather than relying on whatever internet connection there was available in the vehicle. But some of the more fun stuff was introducing, um, let's say, attacks on the vehicle CAN bus. So earlier I mentioned the Raspberry Pi injecting messages onto the CAN network to attack the data or do something irregular. Um, and, and that was exactly what we were interested in uh, because we wanted to try to detect these sort of abnormalities in the data. Um, and try do something, you know, to try at, at the very least detect it and try to predict that um, happening. So you could take some sort of uh, action. So I just say that the kind of critical input to secure IoT is the kind of probes we used. So kind of the probes are effectively these very small applications monitoring very specific components running on the Linux um, device. So for example, the packet beat uh, was something we used for providing statistics on IP metrics and ports on a system. So, you know, you're kind of using things like 
you, you might be downloading data onto the device, um, you know, your your map data, your podcasts, what have you, and you might be looking for kind of irregularities or abnormalities in that sort of data. Things like metric beat will be monitoring like CPU resources, memory, and processes. Um, and we also developed some custom kind of probes here. So CANBEAT, which is specifically looking at irregular CAN activity or invalid messages. So again, I mentioned earlier about injecting the CAN messages onto the vehicle. We were trying to kind of notice these little subtle things happening um, on the device. So uh, I gave them an example earlier of message ID 100 and the payload length or DLC of eight. Um, you know, when you develop a vehicle, you should have an understanding of what um, is, let's say, on the vehicle network, what, mes what messages are being passed around to and from. Um, and we wanted to try look for these kind of subtle abnormalities where, you know, uh, an attacker might be trying to inject irregular uh, CAN messages onto the network to try make a light come on or do something the vehicle shouldn't do. And that was kind of the reason behind trying to do something like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and also V2X beat, um, kind of a similar principle, but I, I won't go too much into V2X beat. This was just essentially looking at the V2X messages being broadcasted by the vehicle and again, looking for uh, irregularities. So these fed the uh, Elasticsearch deployment to deploy the secure IoT, which in turn fed the predictive um, analysis engine and which in turn fed the security risk assessment um kind of cloud site uh, and, and it was through these probes we were trying to kind of um determine what looked normal what looked irregular and try to detect strange things happening and we had a similar principle for the kind of cloud site where your kind of application data is going so the usage scenario I gave earlier was uh, usage-based insurance or pay-as-you-drive. So as well, we were uploading data. So you know, for your insurance scenario, the insurance company might be interested in, uh, you know, are you driving dangerously? And it will assess that based on the data. Uh, but we also had to upload the data um, to the, to the fireware um, deployment. But at the same time, attacks could happen throughout this chain. Uh, and we were interested in kind of, a, let's say, cross-checking that information, which is why you have the um, uh, piece on the right-hand side, uploading probes to something independent, uh, while also something at the cloud side, just kind of also providing probe data. So you have kind of a cross-check between the, let's say, the source and the destination. Um, so again, this is just a, Kind of a more detailed view of the architecture particularly in the uh, fireware component uh, so fireware just ingests the application data from the obu i mentioned earlier the usage based insurance um uh, won't go too much into that but effectively we have um these uh kind of probes effectively being uh supplying the secure iot deployment and it's this kind of cross check is what we were looking at so kind of Performing analysis on these probes, the kind of objective is to predict attacks or at least understand an early sign of attack. Uh, we're looking for the kind of subtle irregularities in the probe data provided both from the vehicle and the application cloud service. So we've um, kind of models were trained both with regular or normal data and irregular or uh, abnormal data. So once the model was trained and there was input coming from live vehicles, there was an understanding of what normal looked like and what strange looked like. So I mentioned earlier, um, so we, uh, I was using the kind of process earlier of injecting data uh, onto the CAN bus to kind of, let's say, flood the network or try and manipulate some values um they, these are the kind of irregular attacks and similarly if you had a maybe an ip interface that had an open port you're you know connecting to something um uh, doing like port scanning um or trying to attack that uh, I, uh, ip port this was kind of uh, let's say other ways of determining what does irregular look like and um these these kind of fed into what were the kind of data sets we used for manipulating the data or to, to effectively train this model. Um, 
and quite soon to be a paper published uh, on this um, kind of data analysis uh, engine um, that we published quite soon, but uh, to be quite interesting, which I've done with uh, partners from both um, Atos and INRIA. So we created uh, several data sets, um, which we had kind of, let's say a vehicle driving from point A to point B. So this is actually one of the trips that we've done in the bottom right-hand corner. So this is just a drive around Cambridge. Um, but we created the data sets uh, kind of without any attacks, what the kind of normal data set looked like. Um, and then we created kind of additional annotated data sets based on the reference data sets that had abnormalities in the data. This made it easier when we were trying to kind of train the models and pinpoint, you know, what an irre uh, irregularity looked like. So, you know, here we would manipulate a CAN signal, for example. So we talked about vehicle speed earlier. Um, and the kind of reported vehicle speed indicates that you're driving at 30 miles an hour. And then suddenly the um, uh, signal flips back and forth to 80 miles an hour. So uh, in, in the message, in the code example I gave earlier, it was just showing how to kind of manipulate that data or kind of effectively set the data in that CAN message. So it was doing something quite similar of just kind of doing something that looks irregular. So if you're driving down a road at 30 miles an hour and the cloud service knows you're driving uh, in a, you know, down a road that is 30 miles an hour from the speed limit, it would look very strange if you are driving at for example, 120 miles an hour or something kind of crazy down that road. But if you're kind of physically not driving at that speed, but the data being reported is very unusual, then you know, things like that is quite strange. Um, but we didn't want to make it easy for the prediction algorithms. We didn't focus on a particular chain of events for the attack. So for example, the timing, the sequence, the kind of occurrence of the attacks, we tried to make as random as possible. Um, so I just want to kind of show, a, let's say, an example of an attack. So if you want to consider the insurance scenario where data is being collected by different modules, aggregated locally uh, at the vehicle, and then uploaded to a cloud service. So we have the vehicle performing as expected here, but at some point we have an attacker who um, discovers some vulnerability and might want to do something to take advantage of this. So in this situation, um, this is observed by the packet bead probe. Uh, if we're very unlucky, the attacker might find a means to inject a malformed payload onto the OBU, um, a payload transfer which is observed through packet bead through the IP port, uh, port. And if they're very clever, um, the kind of uh, payload might even get executed. Uh, if it does, metric bead observes a, a new process running on the Linux operating system. There's an increase in memory, there's an increase in CPU usage. And in the this example, uh, this is executed and it just causes the OBU to flood the CAN bus. So effectively dumping a load of random messages to try to prevent other systems being unable to communicate with each other. And you know this could potentially put the vehicle at risk. So kind of while it's difficult to show mostly because there's so many systems involved, we were able to achieve some interesting results. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that the probes are periodically uploaded every one second. So let's assume it takes somewhere between one to two seconds for collecting the probe data and the data reaching the secure IT cloud service. So once the data was ingested by Elasticsearch, we were absor uh, observing results within five milliseconds by the prediction engine, indicating irregularities with the system metrics. So in this example, the attacker was searching for an IP vulnerability. So the attacker was scanning for open or accessible IP ports on the OBU. Maybe they're looking to use SSH or SCP. So this would have been the initial sign of an, of an irregularity. So following this sign, when a payload was starting to transfer to the OBU, this would have been another sign. So behind the scenes, Secure IoT Service registers this irregularity and notifies the appropriate parties, which brings me on to my next point. So being able to predict and detect subtle irregularities at the cloud is great. And the information is useful to your security operation center or SOC to understand and remedy later. Um, but I guess the key word here is later. Um, 
but how is that useful to the person in the vehicle at the time? Maybe they're driving on a motorway, completely unaware of what's happening. Uh, we wanted to have a means of closing the loop and bring the information back into the vehicle. Unlike the other two uh, security scenarios, um, Smart Health and Industry 4.0, automotive is very time and safety critical. So we wanted to get this information back into the vehicle. So to achieve this, security uses one of the additional secure IoT services to access the OBU and provide information back inside the vehicle. This way, there is something that could be done. Um, at the vehicle level, and maybe this will be to go into some form of safe state or reduce some sort of functionality for the vehicle. Um, so I think just to kind of conclude, so security was influenced by the Mirai botnet attack and having some response for a constantly growing threat landscape. Uh, these co uh, complex attacks on systems require innovative solutions, which is why we were leveraging a lot of cloud-based detection rather than push everything locally to the vehicle. So this talk just talks uh, a bit about the risk assessment part, but there was much more to this project and too much to try covering a one-hour talk. Um, but Idiata brought in some interesting um, uh, elements to this projects. So one of the key parts was trying to be someone who's vehicle agnostic or manufacturer agnostic into the project, because at the end of the day, you don't want to do a project where you're, uh, let's say, showing your own systems in any kind of bad light in any way. Um, but also, I, th I think there's an interesting question here about what if there's no cellular or internet connection? This is very much dependent on having an internet connection. So if you are in a area with poor connectivity or, you know, the Vodafone, whoever is is down, it kind of falls a bit. But at the same time, um, you know, I think it's 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 safe to assume that in in a vast majority of of, of the countries, you do have some sort of internet connection through a cellular interface, um, and and kind of. What we weren't trying to do was to replace any sort of clever intrusion detection. It was trying to address some of the critical parts, um, let's say the irregular things that's very difficult to detect. So these, um, uh, let's say, emerging threats uh, coming into industry, uh, or sorry, the um, kind of systems that we have in our vehicles today, because you know you have your phone, which gets however many updates every every year that you know you probably avoid installing them because you just don't want the hassle of leaving your phone uh, off or restarting for 20 minutes um but it's 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 quite a similar situation with with vehicles and you know the um, vulnerabilities are discovered in different libraries uh throughout the years you know you just have to look at how things change in linux kernel for example and different libraries with different vulnerabilities um, which are constantly reused or you know just taking a simple example of you know uh, a library that will put a png or a jpeg file onto a screen uh, it's probably a library that's tried and tested but at some point a vulnerability might be discovered in that and it might be a difficult thing to try patch especially if you have a vehicle that doesn't have a form of over-the-air updates uh, capability but um, finally, there, there's a couple of nice um, papers and demonstration videos on this um, slide. But apart from that, um, I think I'm going to close it there and I will try answer questions. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. So. If we start with a, <clears throat> apologies, a couple of questions. So the first one is, the driver of a car has a duty of care for any passenger in the car, but in a fully autonomous car, so a level five, who has the duty of care for a passenger? Um, yeah, no, that is, that is, that is a good one. Um, 
I would say the responsibility to a certain extent might fall with the vehicle manufacturer, but I think it really depends. Um, uh, I try to avoid that particular area personally because it's just a bit of a minefield sometimes. Um, but if I'm not wrong, um, I think ultimately the uh, responsibility might fall with the vehicle manufacturer, but please don't quote me on that. I try not to get involved in that area. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Uh, next question is, are systems partitioned with respect to the contribution to safety? So for example, does the engine control have the same connectivity as the entertainment system? Um, pos no. Uh, well, I mean, it depends on how it's architected, um, but ideally not. I, I would say that they're kind of segregated and, you know, you have several different networks within a vehicle. You don't just have one exclusive network. Um, and then you have some sort of gateways or, you know, it's called firewalls to a certain extent uh, between these different domains. So I, I would say if it's done right, they're segmented accordingly. Um, and I would hope not everything is on the same network. Brilliant. Thank you. So with Analysis for attacks being cloud-based. How are physical OBD attacks discovered? So the physical OBD attacks, um, th that, that's kind of just, just, just one potential area. That is, that is one way of getting, um, let's say, attacks onto the vehicle. Uh, I would also say that you have things like the infotainment system, which may have some sort of external interface to you know the outside world. So you know your four G cellular modem, um, and there's some interesting research which just shows people injecting, let's say, malformed payloads in the form of podcasts uh, or, or or songs, which uh, let's say causes the infotainment system to send out messages onto the network. So. The kind of the kind of OBD port attack is a bit awkward to probably detect, you know, and it also assumes you have physical access to the vehicle, so it's it's nearly kind of a nearly in a way cheating. Um, but things like the infotainment unit, which has a CAN connection, it's running maybe some sort of Linux system, um, and if if the kind of system's not developed right, permissions aren't appropriately set, and you can inject payloads or applications onto it you could kind of theoretically and in some cases demonstrate it to you know send out cam messages to do something brilliant so i think we're going to take one more question and that will be um can uh so xcp on can becomes popular could you give some example code or applications on this and do you know if xcp on can can get any improvements in terms of security? Yeah, so I think we've used um, XCP can. It's, it's, it's quite good for kind of analyzing different parts of as a memory on, on, on the system. So it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's not something I've, I've used a lot uh, in my experience, but um, you know, it, it, it is quite helpful for things like flashing and, um, probably where where I'm sitting more on the development side rather than let's say the attacking side um using XCP but it's uh yeah it's interesting um let's just do one more question since I'll answer quite quickly um is the safe state mentioned um previously on slide 26 um is it entered automatically upon detection of a potential attack or is it um, the user simply being alerted of the actual issue itself? Um, so, so, so there was a bit of a debate over the use of this. So I, I think at the end of the day, we want to detect whether or not something was happening. So, you know, this, this, this was a kind of a big R&D project. Um, we wanted to kind of assume that if, if, if something irregular was happening, um, you wanted to have some way of, of, of falling back to. And one of the kind of traditional ways is like a limp home mode, for example. But that's not very good if you're 
traveling kind of 70 miles an hour on a motorway. Um, so, you know, we, we didn't necessarily worry about what the safe state was. It, we were more interested in getting, let's say, that message, let's say, confirming that message at the cloud service and then getting that message safely and securely back into the vehicle. So we, we weren't too bothered about how the safe state was managed. It was more about getting that information back into the vehicle and then let the, in this case, the vehicle manufacturer make a decision about what to do in that case. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. I would yeah. like to thank you again for hosting this talk. And I'd like to thank everyone who has watched it as well as those who have asked questions. It's been really great. I would like to just quickly share some slides with you again. So just bringing you up to date on some more events, we do have another upcoming event related to Robot Day that is on the 18th of October. So it will be on a Monday, same time as this one, but we're talking about AI ethics and regulation for a trustworthy AI ecosystem. The link can be found on the PowerPoint there, as well as on the IET website through all the events. Once again, the link for the IET East Midlands events can be seen above, which is where all the robot day and all other manner of events that we're holding throughout the year will be found. A couple of events there, such as talking together with Teach First, Dyslexia and Engineering, and then the robot day in Derby. All the dates can be seen there. And of course, please do stay in touch on Twitter. And our Twitter handle is there. Finally, I would also like to ask again, if you could please answer this survey it would be greatly appreciated it means that all these talks are done in a way that's suited better to everyone rather than just what we presume works so I would like to say thank you again and it would be appreciated if you could do the survey we will put the links in the chat once again just so it's easier for you to fill out now, unless anyone has anything to say, Stephen or David, I think that will be the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for having me today, and I hope it was a useful talk. Uh, nothing extra from me, Una, apart to say thank you to both yourself and David for an excellent webinar, and congratulations on, on hosting your first webinar, Una. Thank you very much.